Welcome back to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, and I'm joined today by president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, David Simmons. David, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. So it's totally beautiful here, and we are at the Salt Creek Covered Bridge, also known as Johnson's Mill Covered Bridge. Either way you put it, whether, whatever name you're going to call it by, it is Muskingum County's only remaining covered bridge. That is correct. So David, what is it about a bridge like the one behind us, um, the Salt Creek Covered Bridge. What's so special about covered bridges like this? Yeah, covered bridges are very popular in uh, American society today. And Ohio has 145 covered bridges, which seems like a lot. It's actually the second most uh, highest number in, in the whole country. But um, a woman named Miriam Wood, who's like the dean of covered bridge researchers in Ohio, put it, uh, tried to find out every covered bridge that had ever been built in Ohio. And she came up with a number of 3,800. Mm -hmm. So you can see there's been a large attrition in covered bridges. Of that 3,800, she found 167 of them were actually in Muskingum County. And that sounds like a lot. Fairfield County, though, had nearly 280. But still, 167 is a lot of covered bridges That's for anyone. A, that is a lot it is. for one county. Exactly. And most people see covered bridges in very romantic terms. Yeah. Uh, probably the most romantic treatment of, of, of covered bridges was Robert Waller's book, The Bridges of Madison County, which of course was turned into a movie with Meryl Streep and Clint Eastwood. And just that movie itself created a lot of interest in covered bridges all across the country. Uh, but that romanticism is a real challenge to historians like myself that want to try and figure out what do these covered bridges actually mean? What, right. how are, what is their importance in American history? Um, take, for example, the fact that they have a roof. This bridge, when it was first built, actually didn't have a roof. It was built for, it stood for two years without a roof. And an uncovered wooden bridge would only last about 10 years. Right, not covered. So, right. So the county commissioners came back two years later uh, and you know, a roof is an additional expense. So they, they put off the expense, waited a couple years, spent money on something else, and then came back and put a roof on it. And you know, it was built in 1876, so you know, it's more than a century it's been standing there. Right. There is a covered bridge in Ohio that's actually the oldest in the state, the Roberts Covered Bridge in Preble County. It was built in 1829 it's approaching its bicentennial. So you can see with a roof, these bridges will last indefinitely. David, why would covered bridges be so popular in America? Well, the obvious reason is that there's so much wood in America. When Europeans first came to Ohio, it's estimated as much as 90% of the land form was covered with woods. So there were lots of timbers that were available and it's a logical material. As long as that supply is still available, it makes sense to build bridges out of wood. Plus, there were lots of people, knowledgeable timber framers in the areas all over the, the country, knowledgeable in building large frame structures. So you had the material and you had the workers. David, you seem to be the most reliable source uh, that anyone could ask this question to. What is the history behind the Salt Creek? Covered Bridge. The Salt Creek Covered Bridge was built in 1876 at the site of a grist mill. And grist mills are obviously very important uh, in the economy of a local, you know, bringing, bringing uh, grain to a mill, having it ground, and, and so there's a lot of movement of materials. And the local people demanded a bridge. They went to the commissioner and said, we need a bridge here. Right. And that's why it's known as Johnson's Mill Covered Bridge. That was the name of the mill that was here. Um, and it's more commonly known as Salt Creek Covered Bridge. And that's because a number of streams in this area have mineral deposits in the, in the, the stream bed that makes the water taste very salty. Ooh. And you can actually take the water out and evaporate it and get a salt material that was very important in a frontier period. So it, it had you know, preservative materials or qualities for food yeah, stuffs. Yeah. So 
that's how it became known as as Salt Creek. Hmm. I'm gonna try that water later. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about who built this bridge? It was built, the commissioners contracted with a man named Thomas Fisher, who was a farmer from Cass Township. Um, he only built five covered bridges that we know of. And he seems to be one of these people that was only active in a single county and never went across the boundaries into any other county. So he only built in, in Muskingum County. What type of truss is the Salt Creek Cover Bridge? Well, for years it was known as a Warren truss. And I should probably explain a little bit more about what a truss is and yes, how it please. works. Yes, please. Yes, please. I've got a, a example here of a, a frame that's, you know, you can see very, very flexible. Yes. I'm going to make it much stiffer by putting one member in, in it here and create essentially a truss. It's made up of triangles. You can see whichever direction yeah. is, it's, it's triangles. And the forces in a bridge will act on this structure, this truss, in one of two ways, either by pushing it together or pulling it apart. If it's pushed together, it's said to be in compression. If it's pulled apart, the member is said to be in tension. And the arrangement of these triangles in a bridge defines what kind of truss it is. A Warren truss, <clears throat> a Warren truss is easy to identify because it has equilateral triangles. And it's interesting that the first Warren trusses were actually all iron. They were developed in, in England and a man named James Warren got a patent in 1848 for a truss that had equilateral triangles in it. And his brother was involved in a number of uh, railway companies that, on their boards of directors, so his Warren Trust became very popular for these railroads. Yes, I bet yeah. it did. <laughs> Not surprising. <laughs> right. But by the 1880s, it had become very popular on American railways, but as all iron structures, not as wooden structures. But how does this all iron bridge relate to this wooden Salt Creek covered bridge? It's a good question. In fact, it doesn't. Despite the fact that it's been called a Warren Trust by a lot of knowledgeable people, it cannot function like a Warren Trust. The two tension members in the middle of the Salt Creek Bridge do not come together like they would in a Warren Trust. So, We've recently determined that, in fact, it's not a Warren truss, but it looks very much like a Smith truss. Help me out. What is a Smith truss? <laughs> Smith truss was invented by somebody named Robert Smith. Okay. And he was first from Tip City and then moved to Toledo. Uh, and his company, he, he made his company famous for his efforts to make covered bridge production into an industrial process. He developed all these different machines, but he was all about producing bridges on an industrial scale, making them cheap, making them, uh, you know, which was important in the very competitive bridge building world of, of 19th century Ohio. His patent had uh, the tension members at a 60 degree angle and the compression members at a 45 degree angle, instead of having the tension members straight up, he put them at an angle, and that actually saved in materials. Really? So it made it cheaper. Again, you know, this was important yep. in the competitive, competitive. world. Right. Um, he could make them in single, what he called single, triple, or, or single, I'm sorry, single, double, or triple configurations. And this, we think, is what he would have defined as a single Smith truss. Um, they were light, they were cheap, and they were popular all across the Midwest, especially in Muskingum County and the neighboring county of Coshocton County. But you said Thomas Fisher built this, not Robert Smith. How does Smith and how do they relate? Yeah, we don't have any documentation on how they related, if they related at all. Okay. But we can speculate on how that might have worked. Smith was very ingenious in the way he marketed his bridge. He would sell you all the parts for one of his bridges and the labor. In other words, his crew was put up. Or secondly, 
he would sell you just the pieces for a bridge and let you put it up, or he would just sell you the plans for the bridge. Any one of those three arrangements could have been, well, probably one of the two, probably not the first one, but possibly the other two. Right. Could have been the arrangement with Thomas Smith, but we don't know. Gotcha. Um, there's another possibility, another explanation. Smith bid on major crossings. All uh, Miriam Woods' research found that all the bridges that Smith built in this same time period in the 1870s yeah. were really major structures, like across the Muskingum River. Yeah. And uh, so they're much larger than the Smith. You know, maybe he wasn't interested in a project like this, right. a smaller size. Plus, the contract prices that Smith was getting were like $15 per lineal foot and Fisher got $8 per lineal foot. So you can see there's a, a you know, maybe he just didn't see the competition as, as, you know, being worth it. Right. Or a third possibility is that there is technically a difference in this trust from a Smith trust, especially in the, he had a compression member in the end panels, um, and especially his 1869 patent featured this and he said it was to help prevent sagging in the bridge mm. you know, in particular long spans this bridge doesn't have that and so maybe smith figured if people see this bridge and don't think it's a smith bridge why should i get excited about it why should i take this guy to court and he just ignored it so you know any one of those three are mm. pos possibilities <laughs> but we don't really know but it's kind of fun to speculate it is fun to speculate Good. Yeah. David, the Ohio Historic Bridge Association has a special relationship with with the Salt Creek Covered Bridge. It Can does. It talk, does. Yeah, I'm like, talk about that. Yeah, this bridge is really how the organization got started. Okay. In 1960, um, a farmer was going to demolish this bridge. Uh, he had bought it, or actually he had been given the bridge by the county when a bypass bridge was he, he gave the land so the county could build a bypass for this bridge, leave it standing. And he got the old bridge in exchange and he used it as a barn for a number of years. And then he decided he didn't need it anymore. He was gonna demolish it. And this local group of enthusiasts who, um, as it turns out, were camera buffs. They liked to take pictures and they found out that they were taking pictures when they got together to compare pictures there were all these covered bridges in their pictures. <laughs> Maybe we should have a covered bridge. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and it was, they formed a group called the Southern Ohio Covered Bridge Association, and that's the predecessor group to our group, the Ohio Historic Bridge Association. We, we shortened it and tried to make it for the whole state. Yeah. Um, they bought the bridge from the farmer for $300 and like two thirds of an acre. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of a steal like well really it was in 1960. oh okay okay well but still but even still okay but even yes. still so but so you guys have had it for a while we have and we have still have our annual picnic here that was sort of the group got started and we still have an annual picnic here every third sunday in july so every year in july we every come third back. Sunday, the whole the whole group does as many who are you know bring a bring a um, a, a carry-in lunch and and you know uh, a chair to sit in and a drink, you know, that sort of thing. I think that you guys picked a really, I would actually almost say perfect spot. It is a very, this is a perfect spot it is a very to attractive for spot. Um, in the 1990s, it had gotten to the point where one of the members had broken in the bridge, and so it was sagging. And with the help of a utility company, they provided an old telephone pole. We put a telephone pole in the end of the bridge to hold it up until we could raise some money to, to figure out how to fix it. And the local, one of the local families here that lives right across the street, uh, the, tra the uh, Tracy family helped us out with that project. He provided a tractor and that sort of thing. So, you know, the group has always been very uh, much involved in the local community here. Right. Um, we went back to the county commissioners because they had built it originally. Yeah. And said, would you be willing to take ownership of this bridge and, and the real estate over again so that we could apply for this federal grant, thinking that they'd say, get out of here. And they said, yeah, we'll do that. Wow. So we applied for a grant 
got the, got the grant accepted, um, and then we had to raise money to match, it was a, a, a 20, 80% federal grant, um, and we raised 20% of a $95,000 project to restore the bridge. So this was in 1996. We hired a Mennonite timber framer crew from Indiana cool. to restore the bridge. And then we had uh, the HIP lumber company actually donated a lot of the materials. And that's how we were able to get it for you know, the, 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 the amount that we did. Nice. And then we had volunteers that helped put siding back on the bridge, that helped uh, put, put flooring back on the bridge. Um, and then we have a 99-year lease with the Muskingum County Commissioners. So anything that happens to this bridge, we, we you know, take care of it. It's on you guys, it. okay. Right. And um, just recently we had some work done on, on one of the abutments where it was getting undermined by the what I think is the original mill stream for, for the Johnson's Mill. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we've, we've found over the years, you know, we were founded to, to preserve this one covered bridge, but we found over the years that there are more bridges than just wooden bridges. There's stone bridges, concrete bridges, iron bridges, steel bridges um, that really represent the whole history of engineering in the state. And so we serve as an advocacy group to try and promote preservation. We do tours, we do uh, informational lectures in the winter months when we're not doing tours, and then we have a newsletter that we uh, put out four times a year. Uh, but this bridge is always going to be very close to our heart because that's where we got started. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, I love it. David, thank you. As usual, I feel very enlightened. I know our viewers absolutely love tuning in, getting information like this, getting to see what they've gotten to see here today until they can come and see it for themselves. So thank you. Thank you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck. Joined with me today is David Simmons. David, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.